So, yeah, um, thanks, um, first of all, to the organizers for, for inviting me to this. I'm, I'm sorry uh, I cannot be in Bristol. That was a bit my fault. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about uh, Johansson and how he fits into the history of early mannerism. I don't think that my history is very uh, revisionist, and maybe that's also because there is no like there's no word like Johan, Johansenism, you know, like we have like Darwinism and Mendelism and Weismannism, but maybe there is something like, like Johan, Johansenism and, and maybe we can uh, discuss it um, later. I mean, I, I think there are certainly several ways to, to read them in, uh, that we observe in the, in the history. So, um, the, the way I'm looking at it, uh, because I'm mainly a, a, a philosopher of science is uh, through the lens of, of research approaches. So in, in my view, um, research is governed by an approach and approach of course is an actus category. So researchers speak of approaches, um, not all research as, at all time, but it is clearly like something that they use to describe their work and distinguish it from others um, in the English language. Um, but uh, here I use it basically as an analytic tool for the purpose of philosophical and historiographical, historiographic, <clears throat> historiographical analysis. And well, here's my definition of what an approach is in science. It's a practice. So a practice constitutes a unique approach if it constitutes a unique alignment of a problem and a set of methods for the purpose of making phenomena accessible. So problems are around in a community. They are like topics, things that are discussed and, and questions that are asked in the community. And they become reinterpreted such that they can be addressed by available methods, but methods also then become reassembled so that they can address the problem. So developing an approach is always an iterative process of reaching a fit between problems and methods. And in that sense, an approach is also in a way the outcome of research and not where you start from. Um, and the result of an approach um, if it works, is a new way to access a phenomenon in the sense of interacting <clears throat> with it that uh, also entails that you can reason about it or represent it in some way. And approaches are always selective and directed in the way that you can interact through an approach with a phenomenon. And in that sense, I think they also underlie the kind of theoretical or the perspectiveness of, of theories uh, on these phenomena. So now we can ask, what is Johansson's approach. Um, so Johansson ends his uh, 1903 book on heredity in populations and pure lines, which is his most influential um, experimental work. After that, he still had some experimental work, but uh, he also mainly wrote then textbooks, which also partly feature his experimental work and a lot of um, you know, encyclopedia entries or handbook entries and programmatic papers, but not so much experimental work anymore. Um, well, and Jones was a professor at the Royal Veterinary and Agricultural University in Copenhagen. And he also had worked before in the Carlsberg Laboratory. So he had kind of a practical background and, you know, uh, was concerned with questions of industrial plant breeding. Now here in this, this quote, um, I have kind of quite literally, he's, he's catering to his German readerships by giving us some Goethe, which I have translated quite literally. I don't think I convey the poetic meaning of it, but I kind of convey the, uh, you know, the reason why, why Johansson cites it here, because he's concerned with the question or the relation of analysis and synthesis in a way in, in his research. Um, and so he says, the rationale underlying the study in its simplicity is best expressed in these often cited words by Goethe, to find yourself in the eternal, you must distinguish and then unite. And then he um, assigns this to uh, two of his heroes in a way, Villemorin uh, emphasized distinguishing, Galton taught us unification under a law. What I tried here is to combine these two views for which these two ingenious researchers take credit. So in constructing this approach, Johansson took bits of message from both Louis de Villemorin and Francis Galton, but he took his problem mainly from Galton, but he reinterpreted it significantly. 
Um, of course, there are other influences, uh, mostly also um, Galton's uh, followers, the biometricians, Pearson and, and Weldon, but also uh, Hugo de Vries is a, is a very important influence, but I focus here on uh, Wimelon and, and Galton. So Francis Galton is our other birthday child and uh, the one that no one apparently wants to play with. Um, he famously uh, formulated the, um, I mean, he, he worked a lot on questions of heredity and was in a way, I guess, um, one of the reasons why this uh, in a way topic became articulated in a way that made a new uh, reading also of, of Mendel uh, possible. But um, in, in a way he, um, had two strands of thinking of, of it that in a way, at least in, in Johansson's reading don't really come together. One is his more physiological thinking about heredity um, expressed in his third theory. And the other is the mathematical treatment that was then refined uh, in the biometric school. But um, yeah, Galton was thinking about heredity in a context of uh, evolution. And it was clear that, that the question of heredity is crucial to the way that you think about evolution. And biometricians uh, famously maintained a, a rather orthodox Darwinian view of gradual uh, evolution, which entailed that selection worked on continuous variation. So this continuous variation needed to be inherited. And this is uh, expressed in Galton's law of, of regression. Um, Galton worked with numbers that he was able to collect on human populations, but he also made uh, experiments with, with peas that he reported. But here um, uh, I give his formulation for the law of regression for uh, height in humans. Um, and P here is the, the population mean. So the deviation of the suns from the population mean P are on the average equal to one third of the deviation of the parent from the population mean in the same direction. Now this fraction uh, doesn't have to be the same for, for every population, but um, Galton famously formulated another law. Um, so, I mean, well, maybe with, with respect to regression, I mean, the, the interesting point is of course, I mean, regression expressed that you don't have, uh, the offspring, offspring doesn't inherit the full extent of this deviation. But of course, if you think of it from the evolutionary point of view, you have, a form of, of progress because you know the offspring doesn't fall entirely back to to the mean of the population. So um, so that's why selection can can have an, an effect. And then the law of ancestral uh, heredity explains this phenomenon. <clears throat> he uh, formulates it like this. Um, it says that the two parents contribute between on the average one half um, of the total heritage um, of the offspring, the four grandparents one quarter the eight grand, great grandparents one eight and so on. And uh, even if the parents deviate quite a lot, there will be all this inheritance of the, um, the previous ancestors, which you know, will be more mediocre. So they kind of uh, bring this mediocrity uh, in, into the offspring. And therefore you don't, uh, you have this kind of regression um, of type. So that was there and then, um, there was an entirely different context in a way because Galton was a scholarly, uh, was a kind of gentlemanly scholar, um, whereas de Vimeron, the other um, hero quoted by Johansson, was the director of a big family business uh, in seed production. And uh, well, usually he is credited for introducing pedigree selection, also called genealogical selection in plant breeding. It was actually common practice in animal breeding. And in fact, when de, de Vimeron uses this also as an analogy to, to explain his, his work. So for instance, he, he talks about good seed bearers as stallions. And so he, he uses this animal breeding language. Now, um, Gaillon and, and Zalen describe uh, his, his method uh, as a, as a two-step method. Um, they write first, 
one had to isolate the seeds of individual plants, and second, the products of these seeds were themselves individually selected in several successive generations for their fixity. So, um, they they kind of they go on to to quote uh, Vimon. They say the breeder, according to Vimon, must assess an individual's capacity to transmit a character to the lineage. So that shows that. Uh, Vimoran uh, not at all had a kind of proto-Mendelian view of heredity, but instead he thought of heredity in terms of various forces. So there was on the one hand variation itself as a force, but then also what he called direct heredity, which meant that the offspring resembled the parents, but also atavism, which meant, meant that the offspring uh, resembles the ancestors. So you see there's actually quite similar thinking to that of uh, uh, of Galton, even if he looks at uh, uh, more on the individual rather than the population level. Um, so the point was to have, uh, to find individuals that have a strong direct inheritance uh, or direct heredity. And those are, uh, in his thinking, are the uh, variations that are a, a bit older or longer um, established rather than the new ones. So, these are the ingredients, in a way, for uh, for Johansson's approach. And uh, first, he starts out basically with uh, in his experiments with replicating the results of Galton's experiments with peas. So he started with a population of seeds from a commercial supplier. He measured the weight of the seeds and calculated. Um, uh, sorry, and calculated the population average. And then he classified the seeds in weight classes and uh, planted them in numbered fields. Um, and then he measured the offspring and calculated the average um, for offspring of each class and um, found the average of the offspring will be closer to the mean of the population than the average of the parent seeds in the respective class. And that was a confirmation of, of Galton's law of regression. Um, now, it's a little bit difficult to, to know uh, to what extent uh, Johansson kind of what, what his intentions were and, and in which sense he kind of um, had his finished approach was like different from, from what he thought he would do, because as I said, an approach is always the result of, of a kind of research endeavor. But he does report that the observation, um, the observation that he made that the plants growing from seeds in the same class were quite different regarding the size of, of the seeds that they carry. So in a way, the seed bearers had like different qualities. And since he was well aware of Vimeron's principle, he aimed in a way for a better resolution of the issue. Um, however, Johansson did not necessarily expect that selection would have no effect um, if you look on the individual uh, level. And in, in his view, also Wilmoron's principle and his notion of forces was not per se at, at odds with selection of variation in a Galtonian sense. So he comes to a reformulation of the question. Um, by saying, is there regression in the offspring uh, of a single seed or what he called a pure line? Um, and well, in self-fertilizing uh, organisms, that is. Um, so now the seeds from one of the original plants are classified according to, so yeah, one of the original uh, plants that uh, he harvested in uh, 1901 are classified according to weight and then planted in 1902 and then again harvested and their offspring is again measured and an average is calculated. And now you can again, in a way, simulate uh, selection in this data and the results showed that the average of the offspring of seeds in one class did not consistently diverge in the same direction as the mother seeds um, or, and, you know, to a less extent as it would be predicted by the law of, of a regression. So there was not this kind of lawful behavior, but only the influence in a way of the different seasonal and, and local conditions. So this is uh, how Johansson summarizes his results. 
In some lines, selection seemed to have an effect. In others, the effect is to the opposite. And by and large, selection in pure lights le leads to nothing. So regression is complete to the average of the line. The personal characteristics of the mother bean have no influence, nor that of the grandmother, but the type of the line determines the average character of the offspring in combination with the conditions of the respective year. Now the data can be synthesized to observe the population. Uh, and then again, re regression appears and Hans Johansen can now give an alternative explanation of regression, alternative to the, the law of ancestral heredity by saying um, that populations are mixes of lines um, and, uh, and mass selection leads to a shift in the composition, but it uh, constitutes an incomplete uh, isolation of, of lines. And so you have this effect that is described in the law of regression. Okay, so now um, I want to um, ask, well, if this is the kind of approach to, to this phenomenon that, that Johansen gives us, um, like, how does it make this, this phenomenon accessible in a new manner and, and in a way orient the theoretical perspectives? And well, I mean, in a way, uh, it is well known that um, Johansen made uh, quite big contributions to uh, the, the kind of conceptual uh, development of genetics. And um, the, apart from the term gene uh, that he introduced uh, by modifying the term pangene, um, he's uh, well, most well known for the terms genotype and phenotype. And so the genotype is the hereditary type with respect to a character that does not show in the expression of the character in the individual, but is indicated by the average value of the character in the individual's offspring. And conversely then the phenotype is the average value of a character in a given population. And as such, it says nothing about uh, the hereditary type of the population, but if the population is a pure line, then it can indicate actually um, the genotype. So, um, so in a way the genotype, the hereditary type is, is not what an individual is, but kind of what it can give rise to. And the phenotype at this point, uh, the term is not used to refer to the expression of the character of an individual, but an individual of course, so but it expresses the population average, but an individual belongs to a population which ever way defined that has an uh, average of, of that kind. So um, note that on both levels, a type stands out in comparison with other types. The average value in one line is different from that of another line and hence indicates that these lines are different genotypes. More broadly speaking, the notion of genotype contributed to establishing a view that has been referred to as hard heredity. So that means there is no effect of ancestors. Heredity is nothing but the transmission of the hereditary material. In fact, Johansen didn't like the term transmission, but only because he thought that people use it in a way of transmitting characters and transmitting characters. And that's exactly not, not what happens. Um, and then individual variation is influenced by the environment, but this influence is not inherited. And most importantly, uh, whatever is responsible for heredity does not itself vary in a discontinuous manner, uh, sorry, in a continuous manner. Neither are the more or less strong forces or material units that change in themselves or contaminate each other or anything like that. So whatever makes the difference in genotype is stable and unchanged unless it changes in a kind of discontinuous step and then the result is again a new stable constellation. In sexual reproduction, stable differences or difference makers can be recombined in a way specified by Mendelian models. So the notion of phenotype, um, on the other hand, um, the, I think the, the important point here is that it assimilates qualitative and quantitative characters. So qualitative characters, um, in a way, even if they are really black and white, you know, they, you could say like, well, the average, uh, is kind of what they all share, then these, <laughs> in a way, are just the black and white. But uh, in this way, it, anyway, it rarely happens. And actually, biometricians have often pointed out that the qualitative characters uh, are actually also co show continuous variation. Or we have just seen that Mendel treated like height, which is usually seen as a 
quali quantitative character uh, as qualitative differences. So, um, but in a way, in uh, in, in Johansson's um, way, they are kind of like assimilated and in fact, uh, such that all quantitative characters can be treated as qualitative if we look at the average values of the offspring. Um, so this view or this, this kind of well, conceptual reorientations um, that follow from his uh, approach have repercussions in various subdomains uh, of uh, phenomena or problems. And uh, Johansson, as I said, had a background in industrial plant breeding, but he placed his argument in debates on heredity, uh, <clears throat> of, in heredity in evolution. And uh, well, as you see from the title of the subtitle of his book, it was about unanswered questions concerning selection. Um, and well, these two fields, one practical, the other theoretical, were the horizon in which Mendelian genetics emerged around 1900. And Johansson made a contribution to the theory of evolution by showing that selection operates on stable types rather than variable material. And that novelty just in that sense then arises from mutation. I mean, or at least that's, that's how the significance uh, came to be seen or otherwise by recombination, that's not excluded. This, of course, had also consequences for artificial selection, that is for industrial breeding. But during the first decade uh, of the 20th century, uh, genetics gained some autonomy as a field and then became more narrowly concerned with the various modes and mechanisms of heredity. And here, I think, his greatest contribution is to show how seemingly continuous variation um, or seamlessly continuing, var continuously varying characters, which were the mainstay of bi biometrics, could be integrated into a Mendelian logic. Um, as I've said, because they could be treated in a way as, as qualitative characters if you looked at the averages of, of the offspring. So, <clears throat> in fact, uh, to properly track quantitative characters uh, in, in a Mendelian hybridization experiment one had to work with pure lines and assess the offspring of an individual to see what the geno <clears throat> genotypic difference uh, markers it, it had inherited, difference makers it, it had inherited. And Johansson actually himself performed such hybridization experiments and thus contributed to the Man Mendelian analysis of uh, quantitative traits or continuously varying traits. Um, and his results actually brought him quite close to what later would be called multifactorial inheritance, as it was described by Nielsen Ehler and uh, Tina Thomas and, and East um, in the beginning of the second Mendelian decade. Um, so um, regarding to the physiology of, of genes, uh, one can then say that Johansson in a way contributed to replacing a simplistic relation of genes and characters with a kind of many to many view of this relation. While this is very much in line with the Morgan School, uh, as Niels von Hansen, well, Hansen showed, Johansson was also not fully on board with the chromosome theory, especially when it came to explaining development and uh, real uh, novelty and evolution, but uh, this is, I guess, another story. But I just want to briefly point out that next to the conceptual shifts, there are also in a way methodological shifts in the sense that the ways that people kind of took up Johansson's approach and um, used it uh, or adjusted it to address other problems or to extend other methods or extend it by other methods. And Christoph Bonnet um, kind of nicely captures this effect uh, when he writes, uh, in the modern view of heredity pioneered by Johansson and his colleagues, the vagaries of uncontrolled and changing environmental conditions and uncertain ancestry had to be erased so as to enable the large scale harnessing of new forms of life, carefully sorted and serially engineered to react in the same way to, to given conditions. Disciplining the organisms into stable inner genetic identity helped to standardize their behavior into par a parameter that could be fixed. So as, <clears throat> so as in a production context, uh, to rationalize production processes as well, um, as well as in an experimentation context to measure separately the influence of other parameters. And I think that uh, Robert Kohler has, has uh, shown quite well how the Morgan group constructed the experimental organisms 
uh, among other things, by selective inbreeding to get rid of, of genetic noise in their um, mapping program. That's it for now. And thanks very much.